thank you so much for for being with me here today, Doug. Um, here on, I guess, our sort of a sort of podcast scenario here, where we're just going to be interviewing you, mainly talking about your amazing knowledge in the auto industry space and how you kind of expand from one location to seven locations now and in the Baltimore area for Auto Stream Car Care Center. But why don't you get us started just introducing yourself and, and we'll go from there. Sure. Okay, well, again, yeah, my name is Doug Grills. I am the uh, owner of Auto Stream Car Care. And we do, we have six locations actually. We had seven, but we, uh, we just sold one earlier this summer. Um, but uh, we have six at the moment. But uh, been in the business for 22 years, and I got to tell you that we come at it a little bit differently than a lot of uh, operators out there in that I didn't start off as a technician. So myself and my business partner, a guy named Rick Levitan, we met when we were both working at Mobile Oil. So we started off in service stations, and we worked for Mobile Oil, and we ran company-operated facilities, and we used to call on franchisees, guys that ran gas stations all across the country and frankly, around the world. And we, um, we learned a lot about acquiring new sites and doing real estate projects and developing sites. And we also learned a lot about how to manage uh, multi-store operations because when we were running company operated facilities for mobile, we had managers that worked directly for us and we had direct P&L responsibility. When I was 25 years old, I had direct PL responsibility for a chunk of mobile's business that at the time was about $30 million in business. So I was 25 years old and, um, you know, I had direct PL responsibility. So it was kind of a great foundational experience to give me a lot of great skills in terms of not just the operations and what happens day to day, but how to manage the people, the different personalities and hiring and firing and all the things that go along with it. So that was kind of our background and we wanted to get into owning our own service stations. So we bought our own starting in 1999. And that very first service station that we bought had automotive service bays. And we knew a little bit about the automotive service business and we had, we'd had some familiarity with it and worked with it, but not as much as we needed to. And then, so uh, we, started, we started wanting to grow and that's another interesting thing, like, and we'll we can talk about that too. There's a lot of people that ask like, hey, when's the right time to grow? And, you know, it's, is it when you're so overwhelmingly busy that you, that you have to get a second shop? For us, that wasn't really the case. We always had a vision of operating multiple locations. So we were buying service stations. We got that first one. We got our second one in less than a year. And we got our third one in less than two years. So within two years, whether we knew what we were doing or not, we were buying multiple locations. But the interesting part about it is that everyone that we bought, those first three, they all had automotive service. And so what happened was the more we got around that business and we had all these other business lines, right? Gasoline and convenience stores and car washes. We had a Subway franchise. But as we got around the automotive service business, we realized we really love this business. There's a lot of things about it that we love. And so, um, and so we've made that the focus of what we're doing. We created the AutoStream Car Care brand. That didn't exist at the beginning. We had to create the brand and, and then we went out and rebranded our sites. And then what that did was it branded the uh, automotive service that we had at our gas stations, but it gave us the opportunity to go out and grow that brand independently and build independent stores, which is what we have primarily today. So that's sort of, I take, took a minute or two, but that's sort of the, the down and dirty background of how we got involved in, in the automotive space. That's, that's an amazing, amazing journey. I'm, I'm really impressed with the speed that you expanded within, within two years than having already three locations. And so, I mean, was that more a factor of the vision of already knowing that you were going to expand or um, I guess what, take, take us through the process of how you went about then selecting these locations and what, what that entailed? Sure. Well, we, we um, you, you know, that's a great question. And so when we started, our very first location was, again, it was a service station, but it was in, a, in Columbia, Maryland, which is a planned community. And, and uh, the, the uh, Columbia was built by a guy named Jim Rouse. And Jim, and, and Jim Rouse had a vision for a planned community. So the plant community in, in Columbia, Maryland is actually one of the very first plant communities in the United States. And wow. so 
he had a vision. He had a vision for these village centers that would be situated in all these different residential communities. And in the village center, it would be anchored by a supermarket and it would have a dry cleaner. It would have maybe a liquor store or, you know, a, a deli or subway, whatever. And it would have a gas station. And then he would require that it had a gas station that offered services to the community, which included automotive service. So we started off in these village centers that were really located near in these residential communities, you know, basically closer to where people lived than where they worked. And so when you had it, when you had these, when you had these locations, the beauty of that was there was a certain exclusivity about it that was nice at the beginning. And people in that community knew about your business and you got to really know and interact with the people that, that lived near where you were located. So when we started, we wanted to be in community centers as opposed to being in um, downtown city locations, right? We were sort of more suburban, more community-based. And so when we started, that was the first location that we got. Our second location was, it was very similarly situated, right? So we, we, tr we tried to find something like that that was more community focused. And so our second location was very similar in that regard as well. Um, and, and, the third was, and the third one was also. And eventually uh, we found one that was in a, in a city, like a very dense office buildings, a lot of commercial uh, space around us, a lot of retail malls and, and different strip shopping centers and things like that. And frankly, what we learned when we did that early on was that, you know, we had sort of really understood how that community approach worked. And when we thrust ourselves into this sort of downtown business scenario, we just weren't as good at it because we had sort of figured out a lot of things in the first three that when we, when we tried to sort of jump into that that downtown area, we realized, hey, you know what, this isn't, this isn't really our bailiwick because it was a totally different marketing approach. Yep. You had to handle customers in a different way. Customers were commuting back and forth to work every day. And so, um, and so it was a good experience. We owned a location there for probably two and a half, almost three years, and then ended up selling it. So for us, you know, one other thing I think is important to share with everybody, everybody has a vision in their mind that when you own multiple locations, that it's a very linear, linear progression. You know, you buy your first location, it's wildly successful. You buy your second lo location, that's wildly successful. You buy your third location, that's wildly successful. But the reality is, is that doesn't happen at all. Um, there's a lot of ups and downs that occur over the years. And you may, and, and by the way, there's a lot of struggle when you're starting off because you, you don't have the financial resources. And so you're trying to learn and get better and grow. As a, as a person, meaning not as a company, but as a person. And, um, and so it isn't, you know, you might buy something and it may not work out and you may end up selling it. I mean, we've owned, so we have, like I said, we just sold one. We had as many as seven, but over the years, we've probably had another four or five that we got into. And for whatever reason, um, you know, whether it was the real estate quality or we couldn't come up with a long-term real estate agreement, with the with the landowner, whatever the reasons were, um, we we got out of those locations, and so but but interestingly, the first three that we had, we still have. So those first three were were rock solid, and and you know I always say you can miss on number five, but don't miss on your first one, yeah. and 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 don't miss on your second or third if you can help it. Even though I would imagine your third one, if it was you know if it was something that just didn't work out. Um, you could sell it. You could you could always get out of it. We always believe that if you had a scenario that didn't work out, you can always you can always get yourself out of it. So, um, so yeah. So that sort of describes our strategy that we're kind of community focused. We want to be near where people live. Uh, we like to be in centers that are anchored by that that have great draws, like an anchor tenant. Maybe it might be a great um, uh, you know, grocery store chain that's well known that's going to draw people. There could be other draws in the area that are going to bring traffic by so that people are going to see you. You know, what's the car count like in front of your store? You know, the number of cars that drive by every day. Um, what's the residential backup like? You know, what's the mix of single family home to apartment? What are the income levels? Um, all, all kinds of things like that that you'll look at to try to evaluate where's a great site and where you want to be.
Gotcha. Okay. And would you mind sharing maybe like the top three like statistics that you kind of hone in on and like what those numbers look like to you of what it would be like, okay, I, if they meet these three indicators, then it's like, okay, there's a strong possibility that this is a really good location. But then obviously there's more due diligence than that. But if you mind sharing kind of a very high level of that. Sure, sure. No, no problem. And, and, and Rick Levitan, my business partner, he's really like, he's really the real estate expert. And, and okay. I've learned a lot from him over the years. So I can certainly answer the question, but he's, he's really the guy that focuses on it. But yeah, we do look at things like what, what, how many cars are going by every day, right? So what is the daily traffic count? And you can get those numbers from the county or you can get them. There's a, there's a lot of sources where you can get that. Um, but how much traffic and, and, um, and then there's a lot of other factors that you look at, you know, are you at a controlled intersection, right? What's the speed limit going by in front, which is may sound rudimentary, but um, you know, somebody who drives by at 30 miles an hour is more likely to stop than somebody who drives by at 50 miles an hour. So, um, so anyway, but what are sort of the characteristics of the street in front of the location? And then we look at the demographics, right? What is, what is sort of the demographic? So within a one mile, three mile, five mile radius, how dense is it? How much population is there? What are the income uh, metrics there? And, you know, so do you see something that, that fits up well with, with your model? Um, obviously, if you were, if you were like, let's say, for example, if you were a high-end Euro shop, you want to have a lot of high-end customers with high-end cars. Now, we're in general repair, but the demographic model, what you would be looking for as a Euro operator would be different probably than what I might be looking for. And you might, be, you might be less concerned with density than I might be um, because I just want, I want, a, I want an opportunity to get in front of a lot of people, obviously, whereas a Euro shop owner might say, I don't need to get in front of a lot of people. I need to get in front of a lot, you know, the, the right people. Yeah. And, and that's what's going to, that's what's going to drive my success. Um, so we look at those things and I'm trying to think if you were saying again, top, top three is, you know, the, the third thing would be what, what is what are the physical characteristics of the locations? How of the location? How easy is it to access? Does it have adequate parking? What's the square footage of the building that you're potentially going to lease or and or build? Uh, so you know those type of sort of physical plant those those constraints those parameters are going to drive a lot of of what you what you find to be attractive in the market. You know how many bays do you want? Right. In other words, we've seen operators that have five bays that are very successful and guys that have 10 bays and more that are very successful. And for us, you know, the sweet spot in terms of what we're looking for today, we're looking between eight and 10, ideally, but that doesn't mean we'd walk away from a great six bay site. Um, if, if all those other things, because again, there is no, it's not a black and white thing where you're checking a box and saying, because every site is unique. So it's going to hit some things really well, and it's it's going to hit some things not so well, and then you got to sort of put all that together and make a decision about is that is that where I want to be? Is this a good spot for me to try to try to make great things happen? So it's not it is definitely it's a combination of art and science. Yes, Rick will tell you. Rick will tell you there, there <laughs> is no you know put a bunch of data into a an algorithm and have it spit out an answer and say good site bad site. Yeah, there's. There's, there's, there's a lot more art involved than you, you're going to look at all those data points, but at the end of the day, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of art involved. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's amazing there to add. Um, in terms of your, so it sounds like most of your locations are acquisitions or have any of them been like a build from scratch? So we have done builds. Yeah. We've done what we would call a new to industry. Uh -huh. All right. So, um, but yes, you're right. Like a, like a ground up build. So we've done a couple of those and we've done them actually, we, we did a ground up gas station one time oh, wow. that had, you know, that had a C store and a car wash and we mm -hmm. eventually put bays in there. Um, and then we've done a ground up automotive service center that has, you know, seven bays, no gas, none of that other stuff, just an automotive service facility. So we've done, we've done both of those. Um, and they, they have pluses and minuses meaning versus acquiring an existing business. So, the, the, you know, one of the pluses of building your own location is that you get exactly what you want. It's exactly the way you want it. It's laid out the way you want it. You're using the materials that you want to use. You may be, you may be constrained in some way. Maybe the, if you're leasing the property, the landowner might say, hey, the architecture has to conform to the other 
buildings in the, in the center, let's say, for example, or they might have restrictions on signage, or they might say these color schemes have to be, you know, pre-approved by the landlord. But with those sort of, you know, minor, hopefully, elements, you're able to get exactly what you want in terms of the layout, the materials, and the, and the way the, the site is put together. So that's, that's one of the advantages of it. But the disadvantage is it takes a lot of effort because you got to, you got to get, there's permitting, you got to design it, you got to lay it all out and, you know, get, you know, hire an architect, hire an engineer, lay it all out, get the design right, get it the way you want it. Then you've got to go and permit it. And that, and, and we've got a lot of experience doing that given the background that I mentioned at the beginning, yep. but, but, um, but not everybody has that. And even for us, even as much as you know, it can still be a very cumbersome process and expensive, time consuming and expensive. So there's all that. Then there's other fees that you pay. You know, the county might have impact fees, for example. You're a new business coming out of the ground, they're gonna assess impact fees. And believe me, they can be significant. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of potential pitfalls, but then you get a great asset that looks great, that reflects your brand. Um, and that's, and that's one of the advantages to it. But I, I would say, so we've done that. Uh, but if we have our, if we have our, if we had our preference today, we'd rather do a competitive takeover. We'd rather find an existing building with an existing business, you know, in the automotive space that, you know, there's a good reason why the outgoing owner is selling the business. And then we can come in there and we can rebrand it and make it auto stream car care and, and we can convert it over relatively quickly. And we've, and we've just done that. The, the, our last one actually the, that we just did, uh, we just acquired in May. We, we were literally turned it over in 10 days. Like wow. rebranded it. Yeah, it was cool. Like rebranded it, signage, painting. The, it, there was nothing there. I mean, everything that was inside the building was basically taken out. I mean, so furniture, fixtures, you know, we had to get Wi-Fi. We had to put in brand new lifts. We put in all new equipment. We, put, we you know, we put in a, we put in air compressor. So, I yeah. mean, and then we painted the exterior and the exterior, uh, the interior, the exterior, we redid the signage. Um, we did a lot of things there, but it, it all happened in, I'm not kidding you, like in about 10 days. Wow. And then, and then we opened the doors and it's been doing gangbusters from the, from day one. It's been doing fantastic. So. That's great. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's amazing that you're, you're able to turn that around so quickly. So I'm, I'm guessing that's kind of the big main advantage to a competitive acquisition and comparative to uh, a new, new to market um, build. It, it is, it is. But in that, in that instance, you know, people will often ask how quickly do you rebrand the site when you acquire uh, a competitor? And so uh, the answer is, it depends, right? So I hate to, yeah. <laughs> I, hate, I hate to sound like an attorney. You know, I, I hate to sound like an attorney because attorneys say that a lot, and and um, you know, and I have good friends that are attorneys, but attorneys say that a lot. Like it depends. But the reality is, like if you were buying another independent, and we had one that we acquired actually two years ago, where that business was in Baltimore, in Baltimore City. And the business owner there had been there for 40 years and he had a stellar reputation. I mean, best of Baltimore for 40 years. This guy was always recognized, award-winning shop. People loved him. Well, in a, and, and, and so it, when you're walking into a scenario like that, it's, it's much different because um, you're, you're trying to sort of, you want him to endorse you as the new owner and operator of, of what is essentially his baby that he's grown up and nurtured and developed over a 40 year period. And so the strategy is different. So now we're, we're introducing ourselves and the outgoing owner is saying, Hey, I, I was very concerned about who would take over this business. And I found this great local business. These guys are family run and they do a great job and their employees are amazing. And they're going to keep all of our guys and, they're going to continue to do this, the things that I've always done, offering you a very high level of service and execution. You're going to love doing business with them. Now you're taking pictures, you know, out front, everybody's shaking hands in front of the building. We're out there, right, smiling. And, and, um, and he may write a letter to his customers saying, these guys are fantastic. And, um, and so that transition is different because you don't come running in and just change out all the signs. The scenario I described a second ago was a guy 
who had a bad reputation, he was not doing a great job. So we want everybody to know like right away, AutoStream Car Care is here. This is going to, we, you know, we have, we have six locations to serve you, actually seven when we open the doors there. And we, we've got seven locations, which hopefully will say to you that we know a little bit about what we're doing. And we, and, and it establishes a certain credibility in your mind and the, in the customer's mind that, hey, if they have multiple locations like that, I don't, you know, they're not some big chain that, you know, doesn't know who I am, but um, they've obviously done something right to, in order to be, you know, to be able to have um, uh, had multiple locations and things have gone well. And so you come in and then your marketing message is different, you know, because then you come in and you say seven locations to serve you. Right. And all of a sudden people are like, wow, that sounds, that sounds good. And they look at your, they look at your reviews online. And we have almost 3,000 reviews and our average rating is 4.8. So that's pretty strong too. So it's like, you know, where, hey, when you're looking for a restaurant, where do you go? Do you go to the one that's 4.5 with 300 reviews? Or do you go, do you go to the one that's 3.6 with 47, right? In other words, you're, you're going to see all those great reviews and that great strong rating. And you say, you know what? These guys probably, they're probably pretty good. Let's give them a try. Yeah, no, definitely. That's that's amazing. It sounds, it sounds like you you have a good firm process of how of how you definitely transition it, which which kind of leads me to the, to now the managerial aspect of from one location to multiple locations. I know a lot of owners are just like, how do you? I can't. They can't even imagine wearing that many hats and just they're, they're only one person. They only can be at one location at a time. So how how did you go about kind of creating this managerial layer of managing multiple places? Sure. That's a great question. It does come up all the time. So when you're, you know, when you're a single store operator, I think the first thing that you have to be thinking about is, are you working in the business or are you working on the business? And it's a, it's something that we hear about all the time, but it really is. um, It's really the truth. It's really, you know, it's sort of a fundamental fact that if you're in the bays and you're working on cars, it's going to be hard for you to create a scenario where you can take that business and now expand and get to a second location. So, um, so there's nothing there, there. There's a lot of guys that that's how they started out, right? I mean, they were working on cars and eventually they, you know, they added a technician, they brought in another technician, and then they got a guy on the counter, maybe selling work up front maybe they transitioned to the front and they were selling work up front as opposed to working on cars. However, that transition transition took place. But essentially what you've got to do is you've got to get somebody else to do these things that will allow you to really focus on managing the business. That's the first thing you got to do. So before we even talk about expanding, let's talk about ramping up a business that has enough people where you're not in it every day uh, and you're and you're managing, you're looking at the metrics and you're trying to figure out how do we continue to grow? How do we get more customers through the door? How do we increase our ARO? How do we do a better job with inspections? Whatever the issues are, you've got to you've got to create, you've got to create a scenario where people are in the shop doing performing those roles maybe that you have had in the past. And then, and then you're able to focus more fully on, on improving the business itself and generating the kind of returns that you need to that allow you to have the financial flexibility to then think about expanding. So before you get to expanding, you, get, you got to do that first. And you know, there, one of the other things that happens when you are a single store operator is that because you're there every day, it's very easy for you to get pulled back into it, Right because you're an easy target. You might be on the front counter. You could be the best tech in the shop, meaning meaning in that building. And if there's a problem out there that people can't deal with, they may come in and they may, you know, grab your shirt sleeve and say, hey, I need your help out here. And then you're out in the shop and you're working on a car. And so it's, 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 it's hard to do. I'm, I'm not saying it's easy to do, but it's something that you got to have a lot of discipline around. And you've got to get the people in your organization to understand that, um, that your role now is to be out front or in the office, analyzing the numbers, looking at what we need to do to get better. You know, maybe it's working vendor relationships, whatever, whatever issues you're working on, I'm, I'm not going to be on the counter and I'm not going to be in the bays. And then hopefully as the business grows, now you've got the financial wherewithal 
to be able to think about expanding. So now you've set aside a little nest egg and you're looking to expand and now you can go out and you can start to look around in your community or maybe in a nearby community and start to look at sites and look for opportunities. And maybe you're going to, you're going to network in different ways, right? You're going to be, you might be involved in industry events. There might be local associations where people get together. There's, there's other online resources, bizbysell.com, for example, and, and different resources where you'll look around who's, who's selling their businesses. You may just drive around and see locations that interest you. And, and maybe, I'm not saying you're going to go in in full uniform, but you may walk in and say, hey, can I speak to the owner? I'd like to talk to somebody. And, and so you're going to start to have the time now that you're working, not in it, but on it, to go out and, and seek a great opportunity for your, for your bay business to, in order to be able to expand and get it out there. Hey, I'm, I am interested. I am looking. And, and maybe someone will reach out to you and say, hey, I understand that you're looking to add a site and I've been here for a long time, but I'm at the end of the line and I'm looking to exit the business and maybe we should sit down and talk, um, th that type of thing. But that's really the very first step. And then as you add sites and we can talk more about it, but then you, know, then you have to go about the business of building an organization. And that's, that's, that's a different step. I mean, that's, that's sort of a more, going from one to two is hard. And I would say, going from two to three is harder and it doesn't really get easier. In my opinion, it doesn't really get easier until you're at five, let's say. And what I mean by that is that you now have enough infrastructure to be able to manage all that more easily than you could manage two or three, because you're going to get pulled in a lot of directions when you're at that two and three stage, right? You're going to, I mean, you're going to be running around trying to make things happen, trying to be on top of what's happening in shop number two. Then when you add shop number three, now you really got a lot going on and, um, and you do need the help of great people and you've got to, you've got to start building an organization that will allow you to run that. But so first and foremost, job one, get your existing shop running smoothly without you make that a goal and 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 measure everything relentlessly if you don't measure everything relentlessly you cannot manage what you don't measure so have great reporting have great systems you know use you know whatever management system you're using that's tracking all of your metrics in terms of tickets and and the amount of work that you're selling and the type of work that you're selling you got to know all of that get all that you know really really nailed down and tight and then once you have a successful operation that's running without you, then you're in a position to move on from there. Yeah, definitely. I think that just reminds me of the, the E-Myth book. I don't know if you've got a chance to read that one, but a yep. lot about working on your business, not in your business. And so I love that you've, you've kind of definitely hit those points here. But to, to, to dig a little bit further, um, so what sort of roles, and I know you, you talked a lot about like organization, finding those people. So what sort of roles were you looking for to like, definitely, like, I need that role in this position in order for me to be able to continue to see that success? And then how did you go about finding that, those right people? Sure. Well, um, so when, when, you know, when we started, um, you, you, you had a couple of technicians in the bay and, um, and we were sort of the guy in front, like maybe at the counter. And then we said, okay, we're going to have someone at the counter, a professional salesperson at the counter. And then as the business grew, then you might have a second person at the counter. So you might have what, what would some would call a store manager or a service manager. So you might have a service manager and advisor and maybe three or four technicians in the bays, right? And those technicians having various degrees of ability, right? So you might have, again, for lack of a better way of, you know, an A technician, a B technician, a C tech, and have a team composed of, 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 of all those different players. And by the way, we've had, we've had t uh, you know, technician teams where it's three Bs, we've had three As, we've had ABC. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different uh, options there. But you got to have people that can perform the work and do it well. So regardless of whether they're a strong B, you know, whatever, if they're an A tech, people that can do, that can 
you know, figure out problems and, and work on cars and be fast and fairly efficient. But no, everybody is different. Like there's no, you, you've got to mesh all those personalities together and get the team working together. So identifying those roles, you know, as you start trying to, to figure out like who can take that role on. So now you're, you know, you're looking at people and you're looking at their level of buy-in to your, to your beliefs, to the things that you want to see happen. So um, that obviously leads you to culture. So when you start talking about, hey, what is, what is our culture? What, what, is, what is culture at AutoStream Car Care? Well, it's our beliefs. It, it has to do with what we believe is right and how we want to do things. And so as we start to go day to day and people start to really embrace what we're trying to do, you'll see, you'll see that people will sort of separate themselves and you'll see people that are really embracing your culture and are bought into what you're trying to do. And they believe in your vision when you tell them, we're a growing company and we're going to make, we're going to make things happen. And, and frankly, there's an accountability there that as an owner, you have to be very aware of because everybody's watching you. So if you, so if you say you're going to do all these things and you don't, then people are going to, they're going to lose enthusiasm and you're going to lose face and you're not going to, you're not going to be the type of leader that inspires people to want more and do more and create you know, create this vision that you've talked about to them because they're not going to believe that you, that you believe. So you've got to always be very disciplined and be out front. So as you identify these people that are bought in to your culture and to your vision, then those are the people that you want to really spend a lot of time developing. And I'm a big believer here. This, it, I, I tell you this, I've said this a bunch of different times. I've done articles and podcasts and I, I've done a lot of different stuff in my career. Um, the biggest mistake that I made early in my career, probably the first half of it. So let's let's call that for the for the moment, 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, I I put way too much responsibility on people to know what what it is they were supposed to be doing and how they were supposed to be doing it. And what I realized after a while was I just keep hiring somebody and putting them in this role and I don't give them enough support and I don't give them enough training. And I don't let them know exactly what I expect them to do. And yet when they can't do it, I'm disappointed. And I say, hey, man, this guy can't do the job. I've hired you. You, You've got a lot of great experience. You worked at all these other businesses. You should know how to do your job. Well, the reality is, is that that's my responsibility. It's my responsibility to tell people what I expect, how I expect them to do it. And then if they don't understand or whatever, I'm going to work with them and I'm going to I'm going to continue to give them the opportunity to grow and learn. And when I, when I made that realization and really accepted personal responsibility for the performance of everybody in my company, everything changed. Everything changed because then I started giving people the tools and the know-how and the procedure and the process, the skills that they needed to be successful. And my promise to them was, hey, you bring the right attitude and you embrace what we're trying to do, then I can teach you how to do this. And I can, I can, you know, and not everybody's going to succeed, yep. but, but hopefully nine out of 10 succeed. And it's like, I'm going to give you what you need to be successful. You give me that opportunity and I can do that. And frankly, you know, in the early days, I, I probably didn't know enough about it either. Mm-hmm. I had to sort of learn for myself, but, but once I learned like, Hey, here's what we want to do and here's how we want to do it. And we started really investing in people and letting them know that we were invested in their success. That's when things started to turn. So that was, that's the beginning of how to, you know, identify the people that can, can assume leadership roles in your company. And then as you grow, um, you know, then you're looking at the beginning, you're going to have to hire people from outside, right? Because when you go from one to two, you don't have enough staff at your existing location. You're trying to keep the overhead within reason and you, you can't just staff up and say, okay, now we're ready and fully staffed for number two. You've got to hire some people. You've got to, it's a, that's the struggle. Like when I talked before about the struggle of being at two or three versus being at four or five or six, um, when you have four or five or six, now you have more resources. You have the ability to, to get more people involved. And then when you go to open a store like the one we opened earlier this year that I told you about in 10 days, we had some people that we had already hired 
that we that were working in our system so that when we opened the doors, yes, we did hire a few people from outside, but we also had a couple of core people that were in our company, knew our culture, knew our system, knew how we did things and were ready to run with that the day we opened the doors. That's awesome. And I love the kind of the complete ownership mindset that you took over that then kind of I, I can see that it bred through your culture or else you wouldn't have gotten to the point where you are. So that's really amazing. Um, but then in terms of, so I know each location is different, but do you sort of have the same hierarchy within each location that you're looking for? And, and that way, like these standard procedures need to be followed by this, 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 these people, or how, how, how does that look? Uh, in term, you know, in terms of how the organization operates and how it looks, the structure is, is very similar. Okay. And we used to, uh, so, you know, for us, we have, we have a position that we call service director, who's really, he's in charge of the entire store. Mm-hmm. And then you may have a service manager below him and you may have uh, a parts and, and maybe more than one. You may have, you, you have a, a, a service advisor. You may have more than one. There might be two service advisors on the counter, depending upon the size of the location. Um, and then we have what we call a parts advisor, which is a guy who's really more focused on putting together estimates because you're in a high volume scenario and you're trying to get estimates put together and order parts and manage all that. And there's enough, there's enough business to be able to justify having these multiple roles. Um, but essentially, essentially a director, a service manager, an advisor. Um, and then, and then on the technician side, we don't have shop foreman. I know there's a lot of guys that I know that are very successful that have that. Um, we might have a lead technician, a guy who's kind of in charge of making sure that the team's working together cohesively and doing, doing great things. Um, but that's kind, of, that's kind of our organizational structure. And then above that, we had uh, a general manager, a guy named David Asquith, who's well-known in the industry. There's a lot of people that know him, um, but he started off, he, he had no automotive experience either. He was a C-store guy. He came up in the world that I described at the beginning when we were buying gas stations. Um, but he learned the business and he was, a, he was great in terms of running organizations and developing himself along the way. And so now he's become a, a tremendous leader who's gone on from being the general manager of our company, meaning running everything, the gasoline, the sea stores, the automotive, everything, which he's had responsibility for, for actually almost 14 years now to now he's our managing director. I mean, he's really responsible for all of our day-to-day operations. Um, So when he started, he was the GM and he had these store managers that were reporting to him. And he also had retail managers running C stores that were reporting to him. Um, And so at one time he had eight or nine direct reports, maybe 10 direct reports, which is probably too many. Um, And then as that, as it's evolved over time, we've actually sold gas stations. So we've got fewer of those. We only have one left. And um, he now has some support below him that helps him run the day to day. So um, one one person that we have, we call an area manager who has responsibility for overseeing stores. So they're out working with these these people that I just described at each store. Um, He's out overseeing what they're doing day to day, looking at their metrics providing them with coaching and training and development as we need it. And then, um, and then David and, but David is still very hands-on because um, that, that area manager position I just described, that's new to us. We, it's not even a year old. Um, We added, we added a little overhead too. We have a person we call a programs and information manager who does all of our daily reporting. So I talked before about measuring things relentlessly we measure all of our business metrics daily and we put it in a report we call the flash and the flash goes out every day to everybody and everybody sees everybody's stuff. So I know how your store's doing and you know how my store's doing. And um, we've always worked with that understanding that, Hey, we're going to be open and transparent with, with everybody about how things are going in all the stores. Uh, so we have a position where he's really responsible for putting together all that information, disseminating it to everybody. He tracks all of our metrics across the organization, technician metrics, you know, what's happening with loaner cars, what's going on in terms of daily sales tracking, monthly sales tracking. 
We do weekly recaps in terms of technician productivity, labor hours and, and sales. And I mean, just all kinds of stuff that comes out every week. And, and, and then again, monthly. And then we've got a, we, we've just now about a year ago hired a controller who does all of our internal financial uh, accounting. So we, we always did accounting internally, but we outsourced financial analysis to an accounting firm that we worked with for 20 years. And so we took all that in-house uh, about a year ago. And so now we, we manage all that internally paying. You know, we, we always paid all of our bills, but we have more centralized bill payment and some other things so that we've taken that away from each store level um, manager, store level leader. And now we, we sort of have, have created a more centralized approach to that. So, but it took us a long time. I mean, everything I just described to you. So in a 22 year history, some of those things I've just described to you really have only happened in the last three years. I mean, we basically operated for almost 20 years with David as general manager and store leaders at each individual store and people paying bills at every store. And I mean, it, it took us a long time to sort of evolve into a more, you know, um, having greater support and resource in the organization to support day-to-day -day activity. That's taken us a long time to get there. Oh, that's, it sounds also how, how like, I can, I can see how things have automated and really kind of allowed the funnel to really move in a very fluid way. And so I'm very impressed with how you kind of really organized it all. I, I'm really interested about, you mentioned the flash report. And so I come with a finance background around, so I, background, so I know a lot about like flash reporting and things like that. So I'm curious to know what sort of KPIs or key performance indicators you sort of have in these dashboards that maybe could be really helpful for other owners to really know uh, what metrics they need to be looking at. Sure. Well, the flash report is, um, it's actually, it, it's pretty, it's pretty basic. It's, it's not, I mean, in terms of the, uh, in terms of the underlying, you know, formulas and so on, it's, just, it's an Excel spreadsheet, it's how it yeah. started. Mm -hmm. And so it basically would track each day's sales and it would track each day's car count. And so it'll produce obviously an average ticket, right? Based on those two numbers. And, um, and then what it does is it, 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 it takes the number of days, working days in the month. So let's say now we're only, we're open five days a week. That's another thing that we used to be open Saturdays. We're not any longer. We're Monday to Friday. We just did that like two, three years ago. So for, for, so for almost 20 years, we're open six days a week. And we decided we're not going to do that. We're going to go Monday to Friday. We're going to give our employees the weekend off. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we made that change. And we think, hey, we're worried about the numbers going down. The numbers actually went up. So um, it's, been awesome. a, it's been a win-win. But so for us, in a typical work month, we might have 22 days, right? Because there's the five days you have in four weeks. And then there might be a couple of you know extra days that, that, that work their way in there. But so anyway, what it does is it basically says based on how you've done in the first five days of the month, 10 days of the month, 15 days of the month, based on that, how, whatever your average daily sales are, I'm going to project out for you where, where you're going to be at the end of the month, mm -hmm. right? So it creates a projection that says, if everything goes along just like it is right now, here's where you'll be at the end of the month. And so, and that, and that's, uh, you know, and that's obviously set up for every store. So we're tracking and, you know, obviously at the beginning of the month, it, you can have a bad day for the first day of the month and it says you're going to do 10,000 bucks that month, mm -hmm. right? Or you could have a huge day the first day of the month and it says you're going to do 300,000 or whatever, you know, $220,000, whatever the number is. Yep. So as the month progresses, that number gets more legs because the more data you have, the more reliable that outcome becomes. Um, and... If you're if you if you want to if you're given a choice between starting the month strong and then finishing out from there, that's way preferred to starting the month weak and trying to make up for everything in the second half of the month. It's always better to start the month strong. So that flash report, we used to include other metrics on there as well. By the way, we used to include build hours and we used to include um, I'm trying to remember some other things, but 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 basically what happened was was that we found some of the data didn't always hold up as the month went along. And when we got to the end of the month, like we used to have margin information on there, for example, we would have parts margin information. Um, and then what we found was 
depending upon how things uh, shored up at the end of the month, there might have been core returns, there might have been parts returns, there might have been other things that affected the margin. Mm. So that sort of measuring that margin day to day, even though our management system would spit out a number, it didn't always match up with where we were at the end of the month. And so we backed away from that and, and took it off the flash. So, um, but so the flash will measure these basic things. And then what it does is in all of our different profit centers, and, and for us today, it's primarily now automotive, but it used to be gasoline and C stores and all these other things. And it would measure, it would measure those sales and it would assume a certain margin level, a historic margin level that we, we know, hey, in our history, here's what we've produced in these various profit centers. And then we know what our expenses are. Obviously, we don't know about any extenuating items. There might be some non-recurring items, something that you know we had to we had to invest in some equipment or we had to spend capital, not capital, but we had to invest in some expense that's gonna that's gonna affect the PL. But in general, we know what our expenses are month to month. And then based on that projection, we can actually project out a, a net profit. Mm-hmm. And, and so we can know as the month projects, like, hey, where, where do we think we're going to be at the end of the month from, you know, from a, a margin and profitability standpoint? So um, is it, it's not, again, it's not a science, it's not exact, yep. but, as a lead, but as a leading indicator, it, it, is, it is accurate, you know, because if, if it tells you, hey, you're going you're gonna to lose money this month, you're not, you're not doing enough sales, you're, you're not, you know, you're not seeing enough cars, whatever it is, um, it, it's going to, it's, it's going to show you that. And that's probably going to come out to, that's going to be the case. And then, and then, you know, obviously, hopefully what's happening is your sales are great. Car counts are great. And it's telling you, you're going to have a good strong month. So that day, that daily sales flash. And again, I'm going to date myself, but it, you know, it used to go out on a fax, right? Like it used to go out on a, every store got a fax. Now everybody gets it on email. Um, but it's put together every day by that individual that I told you about that programs and information manager compiles all that data every day and sends the flash out to all the stores and to, to the managers and, and to, uh, David, who's the managing director and, and, to, and to myself and my business partner. So we're, we're always, we're always looking at the numbers every day. Got to know your numbers and got to watch them carefully. Absolutely. And I, I love that's an even a common practice for as far back as you've done this, that way it just it's just a normalcy and it's just built within the culture. So it's exactly. really and that's it's really awesome. And then in terms of so I know obviously that one of those numbers that are really important are the sales numbers. And so as you go to new locations, what what has been the best way that you've seen to really ensure the growth of because I mean within a new location, I mean I know there's a lot of different things and owners already thinking about, but obviously at the end of the day, sales are very important. So how how did you go about ensuring that that was uh, kind of continuing on a positive slope? Uh, sure. So, you know, we, the, the answer is there's a lot of different things that come to bear that you have to bring to bear in terms of, of making sure that, that people know that you're there and that you're, you know, what your reputation is and all these other things. So the first thing you need to do is make sure that your website company, um, if you're not doing your own website, we don't, we have an outside company that does ours they can make sure that the website is updated and ready to go for launch so that on the day that you open the doors, your site is on your website and visible and visible to Google, right? I mean, which is the, which is probably the biggest and most important factor. So when you open, when you open a new store and you, somebody Google searches on their phone, AutoStream Car Care Annapolis, let's say that was the location that we opened in May. Man, there's a Google listing, right? There's a Google My Business listing that's got your information, your address information, every, like boom, the day you open the doors, because you'd be amazed. I mean, there's, there's times when people go into, they own a new store, but you can't find them on Google yet because the listing's not ready to go. It's not locked and loaded. It takes a little time for them to figure that out. And all of a sudden, you know, a few weeks go by and, and you're there and people can't leave you a great review, Right. They can't leave you a five-star Google review. They can't talk about the great experience they had. So getting, the, getting that website piece ready. So for your own website, but more importantly for Google, that you've got that, that business listing locked and loaded and ready to go and people can find you and you know, search for you, do voice search, whatever it is that they do to get to you. 
that's probably the most important thing. And you can obviously, you can supplement that with AdWords advertising, right? You can put ads out there when people are searching auto, you know, auto repair Annapolis, right? You, you're going to be, you're going to be right there. You know what I mean? When you look at the numbers on that, everybody wants to be on the organic listing, which of course we all want to be on the first page. We yep. want to be number one, right? We want to be at the top. Um, but, but, but the other thing too, is when you look at the numbers and you find out, you say, Hey, those, the, the ads that pop up, there's a, there's a percentage and I forget, but let's say it's 20, 30, 40, whatever it is, 20% of all people that Google, click on those ads. And then, you know, then you say to yourself, okay, there's a cost for doing that, but now I've created an opportunity for somebody to, to get to know me better. And, it, and it's worth spending that money, particularly when you're in, you know, new in the store and trying to attract attention. And, and you know what? And so there might be 70% of the people that search, they're looking at the organics, but the 30% of the people that do click on my ad, that's a, that's a big number. That's a lot of people, right? So at the beginning, I'm just looking to get in front of people. I'm just, I, I just want eyes on my business. And then in addition to that, we, you know, we do things, um, we do things with online marketing where we, you know, we're sending out like push notifications and things like that. Like they might be, um, they might be um, geo-targeted, right? It might be like, hey, you're in a specific area. You're on your phone. You're driving around. You're looking. You might be at a you might be at a car dealership in the area or something like that. An ad might get pushed out to you. AutoStream Car Care offers this great service. Um, things like that. Um, and then we also do some of the basic blocking and tackling. The things that we never know whether direct mail is going to work effectively. Um, there was a period of time in my career, we used to have all that stuff. We would send letters, we would send postcards, we would do all that stuff. And then I kind of got to a point where I said, oh, we're just going to go online. Everything we're doing is going to be electronic. We're going to be online. We're going to be on Google. And then now I've, I've come around to the idea that depending upon the location, direct mail can be very effective and you've got to figure that out. So obviously when I show up new at a location, my, my new store, I'm going to try direct mail. I'm going to send it out there and I'm going to put offers out there that show me a certain return, right? So I can measure, I've got tracking numbers on the, on the piece. So even if they call me, I can track. And I know, I know you called me as a result of that piece because it was a tracking number that you used to get to me. Or obviously if you physically bring in a, a, a postcard, then I know you got my piece. And so what we found is some stores, it works great. Other stores, it doesn't. So, you know, we're going to measure each one of those things and try to determine what works and what doesn't. Um, and then and then we're going to kind of, you know, hone our strategy from there. But we're going to push as many buttons as we can. We actually today and this is, you know, this is another thing that, you, you know, when you first start, you never even think about it, frankly. But, you know, today we're on TV and we started doing that actually during the pandemic. When the pandemic was on, we, we decided we had thought about doing it for a long time. We knew we wanted to have a certain critical mass. And I think we felt like five, six locations in the Baltimore area. We could advertise uh, on television in Baltimore and create brand awareness, auto stream car care. So when somebody sees us now, you know, we've actually done studies. We did a study, like a 500 person market survey. So it was a cross section of the Baltimore market. And we asked people, so to give you some of the background, if you ask these 500 people, like how, what percentage of you know Firestone or Goodyear? And the numbers are about 90%. So nine out of 10 people say they know Firestone or Goodyear. And I want to know who's, who's the one guy who says he doesn't know what Firestone is. But okay, whatever. <laughs> but there are actually people that say, I don't know what that is. Yep. Um, but in that, same, in that same study, just over 30%, almost one in three said they knew AutoStream Car Care, wow. right? Yeah, which is, I think is awesome. I That's mean, I think, yeah, yeah, I think, hey man, if one, if, if, if you project that out over the Baltimore market, which has 600,000 people, mm -hmm. that's 200,000 people out there that say that they know who AutoStream Car Care is. And so, um, so that's a good thing when you enter a new market, because now all of a sudden you show up and there might be some people that say, yeah, you know what? I've heard of those guys. Um, and, and now they're in my neighborhood or they're near where I work or wherever it happens to be. And, um, they say, you know what, I, I've heard about them. I may, I may give them a try, but believe me, that took a long time. Like that's not something you do when you're starting at, believe me, I'm saying 
22 years, we started that maybe in year 22, mm -hmm. right? But so anyway, so all of those things, direct mail and online marketing and Facebook advertising and, and, and making sure the website's updated and having all that stuff locked and loaded gives you every opportunity to come out of the gate running, running hard. And we, and we had that, like our, and that Annapolis site, it was phenomenal, like mm -hmm. right from the beginning. So, so the, the results have sort of proven out the, the, the strategy. And it may also, one last thing, it may also involve some guerrilla marketing too. And, what, and by, by that, I mean, getting in with the local schools, right? Yep. Getting in front of the, the PTA, getting in front of the booster clubs that are involved in the sports teams in the school, like getting yourself out there, you know, in the community and networking with people that are connected to others in the community um, and making sure that they know about you and saying and supporting those people in any way that you can, those organizations and letting them say, hey, these are good guys down there. I'm wearing, let me just tell you, I, I know I'm on a roll, you're probably, but you know, I'm wearing this pink shirt that you see today, right? Mm -hmm. So what this is, is this is, this is Breaks for Breast. And so Breaks for Breast is a national campaign that was started by two shop owners, two women in Ohio. Uh, one of them's mother had passed away. And so she started a charitable organization called Breaks for Breasts. And in the month of October, we take 10% of all the proceeds. We give free pads and rotors. Oh, I'm sorry, we give free pads to any customer who has brake service in the month of October. And then we take 10% of the proceeds and we donate it to the Cleveland Clinic. For breast cancer research. And so they started this organization, I think 10 or 11 years ago. And it now has about a hundred shops across the country that participate during breast cancer awareness month, every October we've participated now for seven or eight years. When we started, I mean, obviously everybody's been affected by cancer, right? Whether it's breast cancer or otherwise, almost everybody, you know, has been affected in some way knows somebody, has a, a cousin, a brother, a sister, you know, a loved one, a friend who's been affected by this. So it's one of those things that's very real for, for everybody in your, in your community. So when we started, I had no personal experience with it, but we started getting involved with Breaks for Breasts and donating money back. And then about a year or two later, I was talking to my team about what a great, what a great job we had done. I was so proud of everybody. About a month after that, my wife was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer oh. and she's, she's doing great. She's, she's, great. she's not, you know, she's cancer free and she's doing great. But you know, when something like that touches you personally, it makes it different mm -hmm. in terms of your passion and your desire to want to see it succeed. One last thing on breaks for breast. Um, you can get more information, breast for breaks. I think it's org.org. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, but it's um, Laura Frank and, and, uh, and, and a friend of hers that started, um, Leanne Best, and they started this organization. They've raised between what they've done and the other sh participating shops every year, they've raised over a million dollars for breast cancer research since they started, which I think that's is amazing. Awesome. That's yeah. that's phenomenal. And so yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really glad you even brought you brought them up because I mean that's that's an amazing organization with amazing things going on. So thank you yep. for, for yep. sharing that. So this month we're in it, but you know what? If you can't get in this month, then do it next year and make it part of something that you do with your team. And so everybody on our counter looks just like this. They're wearing a pink shirt this month. And when a customer walks in and goes, Hey man, what's going on? What do you, you know, what's it like? Uh, let me tell you about it. It's breaks for breasts and it's in October. And if you have a break service, we'll donate 10% of the proceeds to the Cleveland clinic. Last year, we are, are as an organization last year, we did over $80,000 in break service as a company. Mm -hmm. So we donated, we, do, we donated over $8,000 last year, but, but awesome. um, they raise a lot of money across the country and it's a, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic way to give back. So I would encourage Absolutely. people to go on. I would encourage people to go and look more into it. Breaks for breasts. Yep. Uh, so yeah, if you don't, if you do not know about it, please look into it. And it's, it's an amazing organization. Um, yeah. And I think, and just, one one last question. And we talked a little bit about marketing, not to distract from the amazing uh, organization you talked about, but I, I, we, you talked about marketing. But what, what sort of percentage do you look at in terms of revenue that you then apply to your marketing? It's a high great, great question. Great question. Excellent. But I mean, so um, I'm going to give you the great I'm going to give you the classic. It depends. Yeah. But yep. 
But what I what I would say is you, you should probably think in terms of maybe 5% of your of sales going towards marketing. And if you're growing and you're expanding and you have new sites coming online, it might be higher, right? Because you may not have the revenue yet. Um, and so it, it might be closer to eight. It might be seven or eight or nine. And we've had plenty of times when we were growing and marketing ourselves aggressively, advertising and other things. And we were more in that 8% range. Um, and, and that was a big number. And of course, what you're trying to do, your ultimate goal is if it's at 5% or less, you, you don't necessarily want to reduce the spend. What you want to do is increase the revenue, mm-hmm. right? So that percentage goes down because you're doing more sales. And so your, your, your absolute spend may, say this, may stay the same, but the percentage decreases. And obviously, you know, we evaluate it, we look at it. If it can be three or 4% and you can continue to make the phone ring and we track all those metrics daily, daily. I mean, we get daily reports on how many phone calls did we get yesterday? How many phone calls did we get this week? How many phone calls did we get for the month? Um, how does this month compare to last month? How does this month compare to a year ago this month? So we're, so we're tracking those metrics all the time. Um, but, you know, so if you can spend three or 4%, that'd be great. Um, but I think 5% is a good solid number. That's sort of the tipping point. Like if you're above it, there might be good reasons for being above it. And if you can be below it, then all the better. And hopefully you're below it, not because you're spending less, but because you're earning you're earning greater sales along the way. And so that, that percentage has come down. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Now we are a little biased. So we, we do run a marketing company ourselves. And so we do firmly believe in the marketing, but I'm glad to hear that you, I mean, there is a, a backing from you in terms of just the foundation of, of that spend and how that is properly correlated to that ROI. I'm glad you guys are tracking it as well. Yeah. And I, um, and I think, and I think earlier in the process, you know, the earlier you are in terms of that, that sort of business cycle, you know, if you are a single store, two store, three, you're, you're probably spending more. You're probably in that seven, eight, nine percent range because people don't know who you are and they and they're learning and they're learning about you. And you've got to make that investment. And then, of course, here, you know, the, the other thing too is, and you can relate to this as a marketer, you can you can do it, you can do all kinds of amazing things to make the phone ring and to bring people to your door, but where the rubber meets the road is how do you handle them when they walk in or when they call you on the phone? Is that a great experience? Is that a not so great experience? And so you can have the best marketing in the world, but if you don't execute at the store level and in the customer experience, then all that money is really going to be put to waste, right? So so make, make sure you're making the investment and make sure when you've done all that and you've invested in those people and gotten them to your doorstep, that you're wowing them in a way that they just want to tell their friends and family about you. And then that marketing, that marketing effort just takes on added, added steam. It just becomes grows exponentially. And then all of a sudden real momentum builds and you get great things happening. Absolutely. All right, well, I, I appreciate you so much for being on with me today, Doug. Is there any final last nugget that you can share? I mean, I know you shared a lot with us today, which has been amazing, a lot of valuable, valuable information. But is there any last um, little tidbit you want to share with us in terms of just no. how sure. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I, 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 I'll share. Here's what I will share. That um, for us, for our, our company values, um, we, have, we, we have three. And we have three because... It, because we want to be able to remember them and make it easy. So, you know, I've, I've seen some companies that have 25 values and it's, you know, it's a wallet card that, you know, you have to sort of look it up like, Hey, what's number 22. Yep, yep. But for us, for us, value one is passion for excellence. And you got it. And that means in, in your work life and in your personal life and everything that you do, um, how you do anything is how you do everything. Right. So having a passion for excellence is our first, is our first value. Our second value is concern for others. And we talk about C3. So that means coworkers, customers, and our community. And so that's our second core value. And then our third core value, and this is really the one that I will leave with everybody, is perseverance. And so you've got to continue to go and keep, be willing to be humble and humble yourself and learn and grow and just keep 
Keep going, keep going. Don't let obstacles set you back. Don't let roadblocks get in your way. You can figure your way around them. And if you're a single store operator today and you have a desire to want to grow your business and grow your company, you can do it. And just remain committed to those things that I talked about. It doesn't have to be our values, but to doing things right and treating people fairly and honestly and openly and, and doing a good job for yourself and for our industry, frankly, because it helps all of us. The better, the better we all do in terms of treating customers and creating value, the better it is for all of us. And then, and then persevere. And no matter what setbacks, and believe me, there's been tons. We don't have enough time for me to tell you all the different things that have happened that, that, we've, that we got hit and we, we didn't do a good job or we made mistakes or we had setbacks or there were obstacles in our way. And we were, we were determined to figure those things out, to get, to get better, to get the training we needed and to, and to help uh, get us to, to the place that we wanted to go. And so um, have that level of determination and grit and great things, amazing things can happen in your life. That's amazing. Thank you so much. We're, we're, I mean, what are the best ways for people to possibly reach you if they, want, if they want to know more about these setbacks or just really pick your brain even more about just kind of the knowledge that you can definitely bring to the table? Well, I, you know, I am, I'm, I'm on, I'm on, fa- I'm on social media. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. So people can certainly, that's how I think we connected initially. Yep, I'm on absolutely. LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. So if somebody, if somebody connects with me on LinkedIn, we can certainly, you know, message in that way. And, and I've, I've, I've met a lot of people and made a lot of great relationships have been formed from, from those, from those resources. So I'm out there. You can find me and you can find me on my website, Autostream Car Care dot com. Um, but yeah, you can, you know, people can certainly reach me and I'm, and I'm at industry events. I just was at one, you know, you and I spoke, I just was at one, spoke a little bit down there. Um, but I'll be at apex in a few weeks. So I'll be at the apex convention in a few weeks. And I go to ratchet and wrench every year. I'm a speaker out there. So, um, if you want to, if you want to track me down, you can, you can find me on social media or via the website. Perfect. Well, again, thank you so much for being on with us, Doug, and really sharing all this valuable information with us. And um, I'm sure we'll be talking with you soon. It was my it was my pleasure, Kelsey. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks.